do this or go back and do that. Um, but I think there's a good kind of guiding journey here that I'd love to kind of run through with you. But at a high level, what we're here to do is talk about um, how we think about reliable resilience in our systems. We've been doing this now for about 10 or 15 years, well, t 10 plus years in this DevOps space. But even before we coined the DevOps term, it's been happening for quite a long time. Um, and so there's a lot of people who've thought really hard about what it means to, to, to think about how systems fail and what we in our roles do about it. Um, I'm going to draw a little bit of a parallel here uh, and draw some observations where they're kind of very similar and we can probably think about this and maybe draw some, some corollaries or some connections and how we can use those thoughts or that same method of thinking and applying it to our organizations. The whole reason why we think about our systems in this way is because we care about reliable resilience. Um, if we didn't think about this, um, we would be, the ability for our systems to run and our customers to be happy and our business to be growing would be a lot harder to do. And so it's been able to provide a lot of value for us over this last decade as we've dove into it. Um, but first, we've got to think, we got to get on the same page here about kind of what, what we mean here when we talk about reliability, when we talk about resilience. Um, this was an interesting use case where I kind of ran through this with some people who weren't from our industry and just said, hey, when you think about what I do for a living and when I, about what reliability means to me or what resilience means to me, what I do for a living, um, people had some interesting thoughts on kind of what that meant or what they thought went into my day job or people in my industry's day job of what it means to do that. But, Zooming in just entirely on reliability or what it means to rely, it's about confidence, it's about belief, and it's really kind of drawn from this idea of experience. When you can rely on something, um, it's not blind faith, it's I have something in the past or there's some sub substantial information or some substantive experience that I can use to have confidence in that reliability. And resilience, a lot of people here have a good idea of what that means. It's really about an ability to recover or adjust easily from misfortune or change. Um, an interesting thing about resilience, if you've ever gone through, an, a po who here has gone through a post-incident review? Something failed spectacularly, and you come together soon after it happened to investigate what happened so you can improve upon it, right? One of the common things we ask in that conversation is we say, how did we get lucky? Some, and it's a question of going, is there, is there absolute happenstance that caused us to have um, a positive experience or an improving experience or less damage or less failure as a result of the, the scenario or the consequences of what happened. And so um, when I, when I want to push rely, reliability and resilience together, I want to get rid of the, man, I can't believe that happened and the system didn't fall over type, how did we get lucky stuff. So if we can kind of push that to the side and really kind of couple reliable resilience together. So um, the, the, the capability of recovering from change easily, um, dealing with turning bad stuff into good and doing it with confidence and doing it with reliability. So a little bit about me. Um, I've been doing this for a while. Um, I've, been, I've, been, I've been in this industry for about 20, 20 plus years. Um, I actually got my start um, like six buildings that way. There's the engineering science building. It's now been torn down. It was this um, wonderfully uh, resilient building that was built I th some time ago to withstand a nuclear blast. So it was an absolutely terrible place for the wireless networking communications group and a lot of the wireless engineers to try to push the envelope of what we can do with wireless technology. It was, the building was a, human, it was a huge Faraday cage. But, um, but it, was, it was amazing and I loved it. Um, it taught me a lot. Um, starting, at, starting in higher ed, I think, was a wonderful opportunity, but um, that's just one, one place, right? So as this kind of went on, um, I went and did a bunch of other different things. And it wasn't just different things in different places, or excuse me, the same thing in different places. Um, I ended up doing different things over the course of my career. So I started out um, managing systems, right? I'm hand, hands on keyboard. Um, I'm responsible for the lifeblood of how those machines are performing. But over time, that's uh, evolved and kind of up-leveled into, hey, how would you like to be a manager? Or, hey, I think you'd be a really great, uh, a really great people leader. And so my journey's kind of taken me through uh, multiple different experiences. And the reason why I'm talking about this is because this is a, a big part of what uh, allows us to have this conversation where we overlay the ways in which our organization can fail that are very similar to our systems. Um, I want to talk about DevOps days too. Um, super special. I'm so glad you all are here. Um, my very first DevOps days was, I can't believe this, 12 years ago. Um, in Boston. It was a very tiny, scrappy group of people. There were some amazing names there who weren't famous then, who were also leaning in going, what is this? And uh, it was really outstanding, and I'm super glad you're here. The reason why I call out DevOps Days is not just to shout it out and talk about how great it is, but to talk about how um, I also experienced 
DevOps days through different roles as well. I started as an attendee, and then eventually it turned into, hey, how would you like to come speak? Or, hey, I'd love to be able to come speak. And that also translated into what it means to be an organizer. So I've kind of served in multiple roles, and I've gotten to observe DevOps days as a system or as an organization. So, um, so let's talk about the really provocative talk title. Um, who here has heard the phrase, um, everyone's, complex, everyone's complex distributed systems are in some state of broken at any given time? Okay, about a third of you. Um, this was a really provocative statement when it came out. Um, you know, I first encountered it um, about a decade ago, and I was really floored when I heard it, right? Because, I, what? That's, I'm all about resilience and up, and it's all about Nagios being green and the pager not going off. Um, so it really kind of blew me away. But when I thought about it, and you, you kind of, as, our, as we get a lot more involved in what's involved with all the things that make up how our systems work, as well as if our systems have exploded in complexity, size, magnitude, and distribution, um, this has really resonated with me. That kind of combined with what it means to sort of be a production, uh, an engineer with you know, production engineering responsibilities. Um, and luckily, I wasn't the only person who kind of got this. Lots of people way smarter than me also did. So this is where all of the really provocative stuff that, that stopped being provocative and became very real and kind of core to a lot of what we do, like the stuff that came out of the Netflix group around uh, embracing chaos engineering and chaos monkey and a lot of the ways of kind of digging into, digging into failure modes, they're always happening. Um, Etsy did a phenomenal bunch of work around this, around what it means for them to invest in a bunch of resilience engineering. They had a really great group of people working there. I mean, this is what DevOps and SRE kind of focuses on a lot. A lot of what we're here to do is to acknowledge the fact that stuff fails, and um, we both want to prevent it, but then we also want to be able to um, accommodate that failure when it happens. So we're here to not just invest in preventing brokenness, but we're here to invest in managing brokenness. Is there ways in which when it happens, we can triage it quickly and we can do the right thing for the customers and the business. So that was about a decade ago when I first encountered that. Um, I knew it had to be kind of based on something. Um, and so uh, I did a little bit of digging, kind of research into this to kind of figure out where did this come from? And so um, one of the things I realized is that um, Going all the way back to about the, the early, early to mid-90s, um, there were some really sharp folks out at a company called Sun Microsystems, and some folks who did some founding work in founding the, the Java language and all of that stuff, um, really came up with some, some core tenets of what they call the, the fallacies of distributed computing. Um, and when I encountered these, um, this really resonated with me. It, it connected with me significantly when I was thinking about this. Our, do our orgs seem to fail like our systems do? Um, but before we jump into that, let's, let's talk about the eight fallacies. So a fallacy is you know, something that's not a truth that you should absolutely not believe. It's, it's a failure in logic. It's something that, that's, that's not real. And um, the folks who put this together, you know, this, is, this is like Bill Joy and like Dave Lyon and, and a lot of these folks out at Sun, um, they said, hey, when you believe these fallacies to be true, you're going to have a bad time. Um, and so this is, and what we mean by that is, you know, it's bad for you, right? Your page is blowing up, right? It's bad for the customers. They're angry, like they're getting error pages or things are slow. Um, your, team's, your team's chuffed, right? Because you're having to do a bunch of resilience engineering work, follow up on that. And your leadership's having a bad time because it's hurting the business. So the key takeaway around the eight fallacies of distributed computing is expect and prepare for the opposite of these statements. Uh, and when you think back around this time in the 90s, you, you, for this, I'm a little bit of an old head, and so like it was very, it was a very different technical landscape, and so um, it was very important for folks to be able to kind of call this stuff out um, in order so that they could have reliable and have resilient resilient systems. So let's look at them. I'm gonna let you all read this for a second. Very simple to understand, very straightforward. There's no question about what these statements mean up here. A lot of you had some giggles and some laughs, right? Because, and here's why I think that is, I would bet that you encountered an experience at some point in your life where someone did not respect one of the, or excuse me, did not acknowledge the fact that these are fallacies, and it led to you having to do something or there being some sort of a bad time within your organization or your business. I know I have, I think I, I can, I can I've run through all, I've encountered all of these at some point during my career. 
Um, and so let's talk a little bit about what these mean. So again, going back to the 90s, right, this is a, the, a technology was quite a bit different around kind of what it means for us to connect computers together and have them networked in databases and applications. And so putting yourself kind of in that frame of mind, um, let's talk about network reliability. So network reliability, they're saying, you know, hey, networks fail, right? Like links break. And so the ability for your system to have an assumption that it will always have transport to wherever it needs to go to its fulfill its function um, doesn't necessarily happen, right? So we, this is why we do things like we, we, we in queue, we back off, we retry, we reconnect, we resume, we cache. There's a lot of things we've done to respect this fallacy, right? Because network's great. Um, let's talk about latency is zero. This is a great one. So, you know, hey, it worked on my machine, right? Like it was really fast and performant, but holy smokes, when we're, uh, you know, up in real regions and we're respecting the laws of physics and the speed of light, the application seems to perform differently. You know, physics is real. So, and this, again, this is where we lead to things like, you know, we cache, we use relevant protocols, we, we are very intentional in how we communicate respecting these laws of physics and the speed of light, and, um, and we scale capacity as well to kind of deal with that latency. Um, <laughs> bandwidth is infinite. Um, this is not as, it doesn't happen as much these days, but it sometimes does, right? We encounter something in our, in our, in our use cases, in our day-to-day -day lives, where um, somebody didn't respect the fact that, you know, transit is a, is a thing, and it's upper bound is, um, is a real thing in this world. And so, um, you know, again, complex dynamic networks. Um, what do we do about this, right? So we, we monitor for this. Um, we, we use, we, we, again, are real deliberate in how we're exchanging information. Um, one that pops to my mind is, you know, XML versus JSON, right? Like, there's one way to exchange data that, you know, is a little bit more bandwidth intensive versus, you know, a different way, right? So we, there's all sorts of ways in which we will choose to um, respect the fact that bandwidth is not infinite. Um, the network is secure. Um, this is an interesting one. So, um, you know, security, it's not an end in itself per se, right? You know, you don't, you don't, uh, unless it's unless it's a you know verisign you know padlock checkbox 128 bit SSL like security doesn't mean anything, um, but let's dig a little bit deeper into it, it's all about you know being able to ensure that I'm exchanging data in ways that has you know uh, confidentiality integrity assurance and so it's about the thing I expected to have happen happened and other bad actors or uh, you know I haven't leaked data and so security you know capital S security is not an end in itself but it's really all about the other unintended things that I don't want to have happen as a result of lack of security don't happen. Um, so we, we do things, right? You know, sender, sender, receiver, you know, payloads operate kind of within these assumptions, right? So we, we threat model, right? We do things in order to, you know, respect the fact that we're using secure design principles to support that idea that um, I'm communicating in ways I intend to communicate and I'm um, not leaking communication or communicating in ways I don't intend to communicate. This is a great one. Topology doesn't change, right? <laughs> Works great on day one. What about year two, right? Year five, uh, when, the, when, the, when the cloud contract lapses and we want to renew or the, you know, the Juniper deal is over and we, I don't know, right? There's all sorts of ways in which, you know, our topologies of our infrastructures, they change over time. That's what we're here to do. Um, and so... Um, it, Operating under this way of, you know, it's designed to, op excuse me, it's designed to operate in one way, you know, it goes to production today, um, yeah, networks change, operating systems change, um, uh, we need to be able to accommodate for the fact that time marches on and to be able to uh, uh, respect that so that our distributed computing doesn't break down. Uh, there's one administrator, so this, this is basically saying, you know, hey, a, a, um, bulletin board systems, right, way back in the day, there was like one sysop, right, whoever they were, right, that's not the world we live in, and it's not the world that these folks were living in in the 90s, right? So these, 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 these infrastructures were pretty complex, and so there's, they're distributed, and there's people, all, there's multiple administrators all over, and kind of what that means, you know, there's multiple backing systems, multiple stewards. And so, um, really, it's saying make it easy for those multiple persons to be able to do their function as administrator to support these systems in order for your distributed computing to work. So this involves like decoupling components, you know, microservices, you know, pub sub, uh, um, you know, uh, debuggability through observability, the conversations we have through DevOps, all this type of stuff is really in support of uh, uh, respecting the fact that one administrator is a fallacy. The next one, transport cost is zero. Um, it's pretty similar to the bandwidth conversation. This is mostly about pushing bits costs, right? So whether you're on-prem or you're in the cloud, 
Um, the statement at the time it was made was really about like, hey, accommodate for the fact that this all works because of the network, invest in it, do um, uh, capacity management and forecasting for it, right? And so um, this one's a little, bit, a, a little bit of an interesting one, but it's mostly focusing on don't forget the fact that the plumbing is necessary for the commode to work. The plumbing under the, under the, under the tile is what makes it all work. Do account for that in your organization. Do not think that transport cost is zero. And the last one is around... Um, uh, uh, network homogene homogeneity. So, you know, lots of hardware, right? Juniper, Cisco, all that, right? We, we use standards and we use protocols and all these other ways in which we take um, heter heterogeneous infrastructures and, and, and hardware to be able to communicate with one another and talk with itself, right? So, like, you know, HTTP, WebSockets, AMQP, there's a lot of stuff we do in order to respect the fact that the network is homogenous. So, covered these. This is what someone said in the 90s about how, a couple people said in the 90s about how um, we should uh, uh, understand these in order to be successful distributed computers. So, enough about that. Let's talk about what, this got me thinking, right? Or, you know, like, um, uh, and one of the things I'd, pose to you all, what's in my head is, you know, light, everything that those folks were talking about was about hardware and software, right? And they're talking about administrators and costs, but it's really about hardware and software working together, right? And so one of the thoughts that has been bouncing around in my head for quite a while as I've gained experience in this industry and um, uh, dug into this, were, the idea here is that, you know, like hardware, people in roles in our org are like hardware. And I have a humongous, that's, that's not a 72-point asterisk there, a very important thing to keep in mind. We're talking about people, we're talking about humans, empathy is a very real thing. Without discarding that, and just trying to walk through this example of, um, you know, people in your org are kind of like your hardware. And the software, like software, how those people interact ultimately make up our organization, right? Um, and so following this analogy, you know, these relationships and these interactions, you know, when they work really well, we're really successful with our groups and our organizations. And when they don't work really well, things are pretty tough. We have a hard time being, feeling successful in our roles. Customers have a hard time feeling that they're getting value out of our product. The business is frustrated because uh, you know, we're worried we're not delivering uh, the ultimate goal of customer value. So staying with that and going, all right, well, let's look at failure modes in our systems. Um, is there a correlation between ways in which we have failure modes there as well as within our orgs? And can we use this approach to build reliable resilience in our org? I hope you're still with me. It's quite a stretch. We're going to go on this journey and see if it works. <laughs> so you all, we all saw these. We walked through them. We have a good understanding of what they are. Here is my thought on what this looks like when I think about it with an organization. And I'm going to let you all read this for a second and we'll walk through it. So it's good. I heard some chuckles. I heard some snickers, right? That, that means I'm on track. That means I'm on the right path. So I believe the reason why folks reacted that way is because it resonated with you. You read this, and you're still with me, and you're, you're, you're feeling an urge. Tell me more. Tell me more. I'm interested to know what this is. So um, that's really good. So um, first of all, this should be provocative, right? Like this is kind of weird, right, to think about this way. Um, um, and second, um, a, a, a first thing I want, before we dig into this, I want to say um, a lot, there's a lot of words, terms, the org up here, right? And a lot of people, when they think of that, they immediately think CEO and the big pyramid. I'm not talking about like the big brass and, you know, the org, you know, like your leaders. That's, I'm, I'm drawing a circle around, um, you know, again, it's all about your persons and your teams, kind of how they communicate and how they work with one another in your organization that is inherently complex and distributed. Um, thirdly, before we dive into each of these, I'm actually still not convinced that these are the right words, but this is kind of what I have so far. And what I mean by that is I'm not certain if I'm missing out by zooming in and calling out communication as much as I am versus, say, like kind of working together and collaboration. I'm still kind of figuring this out. Um, but this is like the best cut I have uh, that I'd love to kind of walk through with you all uh, on kind of designing, it can be walking through and explaining kind of what each of these tenets are. So let's start with the first one. The org's communication, the org communication is reliable. When we talked about this through a systems lens, it was about, you know, um, there can be link breaks, right? You know, net splits and, you know, transit, back, fiber cut, backhoes, you know, all that stuff, right? And so um, 
uh, we do things in order to account for that. Um, question for you all, and something that I think about would be, you know, how can each of us optimize for reliability in our organizations like this? How we, how we operate together? Is it known? Is it clear? Are we communicating in ways that are standard? Is the, work, is the communication discoverable? Is it a challenge to get at? Is there a way for us to in queue, retry, back off, reconnect, resume, cache? All of those things and ways in which um, we do this for our systems, are there ways that we could do this within our organizations as well if there's opportunities for it to fail in that way? Um, the next one says, org, communica excuse me, org communication latency is zero. So this is the work done my machine, right? Like, man, it was a great idea, but man, we, you know, the ability for us to communicate effectively or work together effectively is uh, challenging. It costs a lot more than I thought it would. Um, again, how can each of us kind of optimize for this latency in our organizations as we work? Um, um, uh, this, this bias is really heavily towards cash and kind of discoverability, right? When we talk about communicating or working with each other in our roles to be, res uh, to be successful with what it is we're there to do. Um, um, uh, and it's all about kind of reducing, reducing uh, round trip time and being really successful at being aligned with a good, strong, shared understanding of what we want to do. Again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not zooming in on make sure you write the perfect JIRA card. That's not what this is. Right? That's, this, is, this is about kind of looking at all the different ways in which we kind of work going. Are there ways in which we're paying a latency penalty? Or are we, are we not respecting the fact that uh, round trip time is real? Um, the other one says, organizational bandwidth is infinite. Oh man, we feel this, right? Like this, this hits us right in the feels because what we're talking about here is, is, is the ability for the organization to be successful with all the different parts working together in order to go achieve the business objective, right? So how can us each optimize for what I would call like the appropriate level of bandwidth capacity within our organizations? Did we start with maybe like a really lean process that got really fat over time, right? It's best of intentions, right? But we kind of added more to it and did it get, did it get big, right? Um, as well, you know, how, how can we... Um, how can we monitor for that? Are there ways in which we can kind of detect that like we've gotten slower and like our ability, we're, we're taxing ourselves and robbing more organizational bandwidth for ourselves. What do we do about it? Um, you know, um, a lot of times like an a, a startup will start and it'll be kind of really lean, really fast, right? And as that, that startup is successful and it kind of grows, you're adding staff, to, you're adding staff in order to add bandwidth, add capacity. Um, are you revisiting how you were working in ways that are ultimately taking advantage of all that bandwidth that you've added uh, to your organization. The next one's a little bit interesting. The org is secure, and I put secure in quotes. And the reason why I spent so much time talking about what security meant, it's not an end in itself, um, is because I think when I try to apply this to like an, an organizational model, um, you know, how can each of us um, show up really well and optimize for, again, that confidentiality, integrity, you know, availability, and it operates within the assumptions within our organizations. You know, how can we make sure like errant information, misinformation, disinformation, um, doesn't undermine a shared understanding within our organization? It takes multiple sets of roles in order to successfully launch a product. It's not just engineers, right? So engineers, product managers, QA, scrum masters, engineering managers, testers, product security people, like all, all these ingredients make the soup. Um, so, and then what can we put in place to defend against this getting off the rails, right? Because when an organization starts, it's really, it's really aligned, right? It's, it's, people really have a good, it's a really small bench, and so people really understand what it is that, um, how to be able to work and communicate together, but as the organization gets, gets larger, um, what can we put in place to defend against um, things that would undermine that organizational security? Number five hits everyone right in the face, right? Organizational topologies don't change. Um, and, um, you know, so what I mean by that, um, I, I, don't, I don't know if it's necessarily about, like, it's not necessarily, you know, capital R reorgs, right? Um, it doesn't take a capital R reorg to change your topology in your organization. You can have key staff leave, switch teams. You can, you know, there's all sorts of things irrespective of reporting structures that are leading to changes in the topology in your organization. And, and so what this is saying is that, you know, how can we make sure that we're, we, in our roles, are optimizing for ensuring that topology changes don't impact assumptions we have about the organization? You know, change, change happens. Um, it's inevitable. Um, I had, a, I had, a, I had a, a leader tell me one time, you know, um, uh, change, with change comes opportunity. Um, and that's absolutely true, but um, 
as change happens within our organizations, we want to make sure that we're able to best proceed with everything that we had been doing and everything that we want to be able to do on the other side of that change. So are you, are you prepared to, to best reflect the reality of kind of knowing how an org changes? You know, rosters of staff, services, tribal knowledge captured. Are you clear on organizational boundaries between teams, functional responsibility? So having an understanding around how your organizational topology exists to date, as well as when it changes for reasons, do we understand that topology and do, are we making sure that the ways in which we work and collaborate together um, are not falling apart because that topology changed. Again, this gets back a lot to the shared understanding around that organizational topology. Um, the next one is around, uh, there's one organizational administrator. So um, again, drawing from what we talked about before, the administrator is the steward of the thing that does a function in a role. right? That, that, so there's multiple people in an organization who do this. Um, you know, so um, what we really need to make sure we do is that we're making sure that um, we're, we're these stewards, whoever they are in whatever role they are in, they can operate successfully with the challenge that they've got, um, uh, and they're not, they're not, uh, there's no assumptions made that we're not able to set these stewards up for success. Um, again, like I said, it's many ingredients go into the soup of what it means for us to ship products successfully or, or unlock business value for our organization. Um, the next one was talking about organizational cost. Uh, of, uh, organizational cost of working together is zero. Um, um, what we should be thinking about, you know, again, we, number seven on the last one was all about like budgeting for it, right? Make sure you don't like not pay the bill for, you know, the, the, the backbone and the edge, the edge networking in order to allow us to successfully push bits with our distributed systems. So when we think about this through the lens of our organization, you know, how can each of us optimize for ensuring the org? Um, you know, that um, the cost of doing business is accounted for, is manageable, doesn't explode, it's not invisible. Right? There's a handful of different things that as a business leader, and I don't mean the person at the top, like all of us kind of care about our business being successful, we want to make sure that we account for the fact that uh, the cost of us working together is zero. And so we want to be able to watch for that. You watch the, just like you watch the AWS, you know, transit bill, right? You want to make sure that you don't get hit with, so you want to monitor for this. And I don't mean you, the boss at the top, kind of all of us taking a look at how we're working together, um, are we accounting for that cost? Um, and is it, um, uh, is it ballooning, and do we need to do something about it, and what do we do about it? And I'll talk about that in a minute. And then the last one is around organizational uh, hom homogeneity, right? The org's not, uh, or the, the fallacy that the org is, is homogenous. We all know it isn't. It seems really straightforward uh, for us to think about. But, you know, are there ways in which we're working um, that might be, like, really tightly coupled where a way in which an, another team might decide to start working might break that down? I don't know. We all do two-week sprints, right? But one group decides they want to I don't know, do Kanban, right? Um, so there's, you, you, there's all sorts of ways in which there's various different, various different ways in which our organization can have differences in sort of how we're working, how we're organized, um, how we interact with one another in order to be successful with our role. Um, you know, do we have something exceptional and proprietary um, that, uh, around the way we're working that is um, impacting us and making it hard for us to be successful? Um, do you have six teams all developing software in different ways, right? Again, I'm not saying don't not do that, but account for the fact that th at that you need to understand that the, 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 the people in the organization need to be able to, to be successful working together. So um, let's talk about what we can do about it. <laughs> so um, again, you're all in different roles. Um, I'm, I, one of the things I love about DevOps days is you're not all DevOps, right? You're, there, there, there's, there's scrum masters here. I ran into project managers. There's founders. There's VPs. There's entry-level QA testers here, right? You are all in different roles, and I, would, I want you to leave here understanding that that's a feature, not a bug. Because everything I just talked through, and when I talk about what to do about it, I suspect some of you are going, man, I don't know how to fix that. There's no way I could... That, that's the boss at the top, right? And I'm, I'm trying to couch you all away from that, because each of us... Can take, can take this home with us. So let's start again. For those of you who are in a position of authority, um, you, are in, you have some uh, ability to go back and make active change as you lean into this and think about this if it resonates with you. But a lot of you aren't. A lot of you are individual contributors. A lot of you are you know, an engineer or an SRE or um, you know, a software tester. Um, that's okay. Um, the first thing I would encourage you to do is to go take a look at your feedback loops 
that you currently have available to you right now. Um, you probably do retrospectives. So you probably already have like a free way for you to start parking ideas into your team dynamic around improvements in this area as you see them as they apply to your org. There's probably all kinds of other stuff too. Feedback surveys and you know, uh, upward feedback. You know, there's lots of different ways in which you have feedback loops. Um, let's say you don't have those for some reason or you used them and you're feeling like it's not working. Um, you can still build inertia through influence, right? Just talking about this stuff with other people in the organization, um, particularly when, a, and I would say use an opportunity when there's a challenge, right? When one of these fallacies isn't respected in your organization and everyone's having a tough time, even if you're not in the middle of a retrospective meeting, that's an opportunity for you to advance the idea around uh, getting people also bought in to what it is that you see an opportunity to improve. Um, I would definitely get people on board with acknowledging the constraint or acknowledging the frustration and the pain first before you talk about ideas. Um, but, uh, but once you've kind of got people bought in with like, yeah, you're right, Nick, or you're right, Boyd, or Sean, or JJ, that was really rough. And then once they are bought into it being really rough, that's when you can kind of talk with them about what the opportunity that you see to improve is. The, the big, big important thing I want you all to understand is that one thing in the bottom right. Someone in your org who can do something about this really wants to hear from you about this. It may not be your manager. It may not be your manager's manager. It may be some manager two teams over. You know, I, I don't know how your organization's set up. I also kind of don't know what the constraints are you're going through, but rest assured, out of everyone within your organization, someone in that, in that roster cares about it these fallacies not, uh, not being respected and ways in which they can be improved upon within your organization. Um, with this one, you know, um, you always got to keep it in perspective. And what I mean by that is it costs calories to invest here. Um, it's costing calories for me to talk, you to listen, you know, and so, um, Caring about building this reliable resilience in our organizations at cost. I'm not talking about dollars, I'm talking about, about people effort. And people effort can draw on you. Um, it can draw on you physically, it can draw on you mentally. And what I mean by that is um, you have to watch out for your organization the same way you would with the infrastructure when you join it. How many of us have joined an org and we come in and we go, holy smokes, this tech stack is borked. Like, it, it's a real tire fire here. How are they possible? How is this business still open? I have to fix all this? Oh my gosh. I saw some hands. That's okay. We've all been through it. Um, we've gone through that where we go, maybe this place isn't for me. Maybe this is too far gone. I don't know if I can mop this up. I don't know, I don't know if we can move mountains here. And so just like when you join an organization and you look at the tech stack, around, you know, um, did, did some people not respect those fallacies of distributed computing earlier and now the, team, the org is still paying for it? We look very critically at, the, at the, the architecture diagrams and we dive in very heavily there. It's just what we do, right? A lot of engineers and a lot of, you know, it's just how our mind works. I would also say look at your org, right? And do it early, right? Go back and do it now. Look at your org. Um, you should apply the same rigor around how borked is this to know whether or not your calories will be able to pay off. Um, um, one of, the, one of the things I will, I've used in the past in some of my prior roles has been what I call the crazy quotient. Um, and what I mean by that is when an organization is having some challenging times, um, you're always watching out for the crazy quotient. Like how wild is it, right? How challenging is it to be successful in our roles? How is the organization doing from a health perspective? And the crazy quotient is a good internal barometer for you to let you know you need to leave. Right? If the organization, man, this is, it, it's, it's so crazy, it's making me crazy. It's hurting my physical and mental health. And that's really a good sign for you um, uh, around your need to kind of move on there. So again, I'm not encouraging you all to go home and leave your, leave your jobs. Not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, you know, um, invest here, right? But, you know, you, you want to watch out for it. You know, just like you wouldn't want to be spending a ton of time trying to piecemeal fix a really, really broken piece of infrastructure. It's very analogous to that. And so um, the last thing I wanted to say is, um, you know, let's keep talking, right? My goal here is to help you out in ways in which you'd find valuable. That's what brought me here. That's why I'm here. I, I love talking to people and kind of hearing what's going on with them and, and what they're looking for and just sharing what I've been through and trying to offer perspective. And uh, if people can t find that useful, I love it. That's awesome. Um, so I'm right at about the end of my time. I think I'm a couple minutes early. Um, if there's interest here, you know, let's open space about this, right? I think there, um, there may be an opportunity with the, uh, um, we were looking at um, uh, executives or like what are executives thinking, why? I don't know, this may be an opportunity to combine that, but 
Um, you know, if folks have an interest in continuing this conversation, I'm happy to give time in an open space. That being said, if people don't want to do open space, that's fine too. But if at least one of you out there want to keep talking about this, come grab me. Um, you'll see me around all day. I'm happy to uh, um, eat, you know, eat lunch with you, grab a coffee, just chat, whatever. Um, I find this stuff really cool, and if you'd like to follow up and chat with me about it, happy to do it. So thank you very much. Awesome job, Nick. Thank you very much. Uh, do I have a representative from SIVO?